Hi, I'm Kenan Hurd from the University of Colorado Department of Emergency Medicine, Section of Medical Pharmacology and Toxicology in the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center. I'm here today to talk to you about how I evaluate and manage poison patients presenting to the emergency department. So the objectives of my talk are to take you through how I evaluate and manage poison patients. I have a five-step approach that I use. The first step is resuscitation, second step is risk assessment, third step is decontamination, fourth step is testing for occult ingestion, and the final step is observation. So resuscitation of the poison patient looks a lot like resuscitation of any medical patient. Uh, the initial step is going to be uh, evaluation and management of the airway. Now, the airway can be a critical issue, for example, in a patient who's ingested a caustic and has significant airway swelling, and we need to intervene early to prevent uh, complete loss of airway. But in most poison patients, the issue around airway is really going to do with a, a decrease in mental status and loss of airway reflexes. Now, the reason it's important to consider this when managing a poison patient is if you look at the vast majority of poisonings that kill patients in the United States, things like uh, opioid sedatives, uh, haloperidol antipsychotics, the antidepressant drugs, muscle relaxants, seizure medications. All of these act primarily through CNS depression, leading to a loss of airway, and that's the ultimate cause of death in the vast majority of patients. Therefore, if you actively manage the patient's airway and maintain their respirations, you're going to prevent the vast majority of poisoning deaths uh, from these agents. Now, the second part of uh, resuscitation is breathing. And breathing, you're going to treat the patient with high flow oxygen. Um, but the most important thing uh, in managing these poison patients is going to be to maintain their minute ventilation. And this is important because mm -hmm. poisoning often causes a metabolic acidosis. And patients who have a metabolic acidosis are going to try and compensate for that through increasing their minute ventilation. If you take a patient who's got a significant metabolic acidosis and put them on a ventilator with standard initial ventilatory settings, that acidosis is going to get worse, leading to profound metabolic acidosis and potential cardiovascular collapse. So you really need to hyperventilate these patients on the initial settings and then adjust the ventilator as needed based on their, on their blood gas. The third step in resuscitating a poison patient is managing uh, disorders of the circulation. That really comes down to two things. The first is blood pressure and the second is rhythm. Now, in terms of blood pressure, the management of the hypotensive poison patient is going to look a lot like any other management of a patient with hypotension from medical causes. You're going to give them fluids because the majority of patients are going to be hypovolemic, either because they've been vomiting uh, or haven't had a lot of oral intake because of decreased mental status, or because they have vasodilatation because many of the poisonings that we see cause some degree of peripheral vasodilatation. In either event, the first step is going to be managing these patients with fluids. The second step is adrenergic vasopressors, so epinephrine and norepinephrine are my drugs of choice. Uh, the doses, we're going to start off with standard doses that you would use in any medical patient, but it's important to recognize that the sort of maximum doses that we normally talk about were derived for patients with sepsis or cardiovascular causes of their hypotension. In the setting of an overdose, in particular when you're talking about something that may interfere with the function of these receptors, going higher often leads to an increased response. So we rarely consider sort of a patient maxed out on the maximal doses, and we'll continue increasing the dose of their uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine to the point where we start to get a response. Now, uh, the other side of circulation is uh, the rhythm, and rhythms break down into really two categories, uh, slow and fast, and the management of a slow rhythm from poisoning is going to be essentially the same way that you manage it for uh, any other type of cause in ACLS. Initially, you're going to start with atropine. Now, we recognize that many types of poisonings aren't going to respond to atropine. If you do have a patient with a uh, organophosphate or cholinergic type of poisoning, they're going to respond, but they may need high doses of atropine. Occasionally, patients with a cardioactive steroid poisoning will respond initially to atropine, although that's not often long-lived. So many patients are going to need to go on to pacing. Um, external pacing or internal pacing, either are used, and it's certainly a reasonable intervention, although it's important that unlike a, a primary cardiac cause of bradycardia, many times uh, patients who have bradycardia from poisoning will also have concomitant decrease in, in their contractility. So even though you may be able to get their rate up, you often won't see improved uh, overall hemodynamics and, and may require additional treatment for their hypotension. Patients who are tachycardic, we look at two types of tachycardia. First is a narrow complex tachycardia. Again, the most common cause of a narrow complex tachycardia is going to be hypovolemia, vasodilatation, should respond to some fluids. Another common cause is patients who ingest, a, for example, a sympathomimetic or CNS stimulant are going to have increased sympathetic outflow, and their tachycardia is actually going to be due primarily to their CNS agitation. And so those patients need to be treated with sedation, usually with benzodiazepines. Occasionally, you'll come across a patient with a, a tachycardia that's actually 
actually not agitated, doesn't respond to fluids. In the most cases, we're going to just watch these patients. It's rarely necessary to intervene uh, using a cardioactive drug to try and decrease their heart rate. For the vast majority of these patients, it's simply going to be observation and time and allow that tachycardia to resolve. Now, the one place uh, resuscitation starts to take a different turn when you're talking about a poison patient as opposed to other causes of, uh, cardi of uh, cardiac instability is in the setting of a wide complex tachycardia. In most medical settings, a wide complex tachycardia is going to be due to myocardial ischemia or underlying structural cardiac disease, and therefore the treatment is going to be cardioversion or possibly amiodarone. In the setting of a poisoning, the most common cause of a wide complex tachycardia is going to be a sodium channel blocking drug. And in that setting, the treatment of choice is hypertension tonic sodium bicarbonate, usually one to two milliequivalents per kilogram given as a bolus. These folks will usually have a very prompt response. Their QRS complex will narrow. Their cardiovascular uh, status will improve. Occasionally, you may need to repeat the doses or give multiple doses. Um, but in general, patients with a sodium channel blocking drug are going to respond um, pretty promptly and effectively to uh, boluses of sodium bicarbonate. So that sort of wraps up uh, resuscitation step in a nutshell. Again, early airway management in particular uh, be for patients with CNS depression, hyperventilation early on to counteract any metabolic acidosis. Bradycardic patients are treated with atropine and pacing, tachycardic narrow complex fluids and sedation, and tachycardic wide complex consider giving sodium bicarbonate for possible sodium channel effects. So after we resuscitated the patient, or if the patient presents and they're clinically stable, the next step is to perform a risk assessment. And I believe a risk assessment is important because it helps guide the future uh, therapeutics that we're going to consider. When I do a risk assessment, I consider three things, the drug, the dose, and the patient. The drug is important to consider because each drug has a different inherent toxicity. For example, we all would recognize that cyanide has more inherent toxicity than something like ibuprofen. And so I uh, would want you to consider, is this a drug that I'm worried about or not? Sometimes that information is readily available. You have experience with the drug. You're aware of how dangerous it is. Other times you may need to use other resources, such as textbooks or the poison center or uh, an electronic database to exactly sort out how, how serious the type of exposure is. The second thing I consider is the dose. And the dose is important for two reasons. The first reason is obvious. A very low dose of anything may be non-toxic. I can give you a milligram of cyanide, and, I, and you're not going to get sick from that. Uh, and so if you know that it's a low dose, the history uh, of a relatively low dose of a drug um, that's below the toxic range or even in the therapeutic range, you recognize that the risk of toxicity is minimal. On the other hand, a high dose, in particular a massive overdose, you can get very unpredictable clinical effects. The drug doesn't behave like it behaves in therapeutic doses. Um, and the reason is, is that when we take a drug in a therapeutic serum concentration and that drug interacts with whatever its target is to cause its clinical effects. An example of this would be a tricyclic antidepressant where we know if we take a therapeutic dose and get a therapeutic serum concentration, the primary effects that we're going to see are going to be in the brain on the monoamine transporters where they affect norepinephrine reuptake and, and mediate their effects on depression. However, if we get to an overdose, much higher serum concentrations, we're going to start to see effects on the cardiac sodium channels. And that's where we get the cardiovascular effects that characterize a classic tricyclic antidepressant overdose. If you get into any type of overdose where you're talking uh, overdose of maybe 20, 50 times the therapeutic dose, the effects that we expect to see become very unpredictable. Most people don't have a lot of experience with these overdoses, so I think it's very hard to use the available information to accurately risk stratify a patient with a massive overdose. The last thing that I would consider uh, in my risk assessment is the patient. And uh, most of the time, the patient's characteristics are not going to contribute a lot to the risk assessment, but sometimes they can. An example would be a patient who ingests a drug that's likely to cause seizures in a patient with an underlying seizure disorder, or perhaps a drug that's cleared by the kidneys uh, and is a patient with renal dysfunction. It's also important to consider the very young and the very old because the clinical effects of the drugs in these populations can be quite different. So based on consideration of the drug, the dose, and the patient, I'm going to come to a conclusion of, I believe this patient is at high risk to get sick from the medications that they've taken, or I believe this patient is not likely to get sick from the medication that they've taken, or again, at the end, maybe that I don't have enough information and I need to take the information I have, use other available resources such as a textbook or online resources or probably the Poison Center to get, gather that information and come up with a complete risk assessment. Now, if my risk assessment is that patient's likely to do well, then I don't need to be very aggressive in my further treatments, and I'm probably just going to watch that patient and treat any um, symptoms as they start to come up. 
But if my assessment is, I believe this patient has taken a large enough dose of a particularly dangerous drug and they are at risk for significant toxicity, I want to try and intervene to, to mitigate some of that risk. And the, one of the most effective ways we can try and do this is through gastric decontamination. And there are really four methods of gastric decontamination that we see. The first is the patient's uh, sort of auto evacuating or throwing up uh, on their own. And in that case, if you're seeing that the patient's throwing up, if they're maintaining their airway okay, they're not at risk for aspiration, and they're bringing up, uh, you can see that they're actually bringing up pill products or, or products of what they ingested, I allow those patients to have, um, to continue to vomit as long as they seem to be maintaining their airway well, they're not at risk for uh, causing injury to themselves from their vomiting, and I'm getting uh, effective return of pills. I'll let that continue, and then I'll, I'll intervene and try and control their symptoms once that uh, Clear, I don't seem to be getting effective decontamination. The second and probably most common means of decontamination we consider is activated charcoal. Now, activated charcoal works by adsorbing any drug that continues to be in the GI tract before it can move into the blood and cause systemic toxicity. Activated charcoal uh, is effective and is, should be considered when you feel like there's a good chance that there's still a dangerous amount of drug in the GI tract that could go on to cause serious effects. I believe it's safe to administer this to patients who are awake and alert and are willing to drink it, and I'll give it to them if they're awake and alert and they can drink it on their own. Uh, I think the risk of aspiration is pretty low. Now, if the patient is not cooperative or has altered mental status and they're not going to be able to drink it on their own, I'm not willing to put an NG tube down simply to administer charcoal. On the other hand, if I've already managed that patient's airway, I am comfortable giving activated charcoal down an azogastric tube using my usual precautions. The next means of decontamination I would consider is gastric lavage. And gastric lavage is something that should be rarely used, but it is important to understand, especially in the setting of a drug that's not going to be well absorbed to charcoal or in the setting of an overdose that's so large that I don't think I'm going to be able to give enough charcoal to absorb that drug and prevent the systemic absorption. Now, gastric lavage is not something we commonly perform. We do have a video available that you can look at real time if you ever need to perform this that gives you some basic uh, instructions on how to perform it safely. The important thing is you need to make sure the patient is either protecting their airway well or has their airway managed prior to performing gastric lavage. The last kind of decontamination that we commonly consider would be whole bowel irrigation. Now, whole bowel irrigation is not something that's going to be routinely done in the emergency department. It may be started here. It's most useful for things like sustained release drugs or drugs that are going to have prolonged absorption and aren't absorbed well by charcoal, things like lithium. Uh, in that setting, it may be worth considering, and again, I encourage you to contact your poison center if you think someone could benefit from whole bowel irrigation. So we've resuscitated the patient, we've performed a re risk assessment, decided to decontaminate or not. The next step we're going to do on our poison patient is to, to do some basic laboratory testing for a cold ingestion. And the most important thing to look for in a cold ingestion is acetaminophen. And the reason is it's common, it's in everybody's medicine chest. It's not something that causes symptoms early on. If you don't test for it, you won't detect it. And most importantly, it's responsive to early treatment. If we identify it early and intervene, we can prevent the serious toxicity, whereas if we only identify it late, our treatment is much less effective. So we recommend a routine screening acetaminophen on all of our patients. If the acetaminophen is non-detectable, you're good. You don't need to worry about it. If that acetaminophen comes back positive and you don't have any history of time of ingestion, you're going to need to discuss that case with your poison center or toxicologist to come up with an appropriate treatment plan. The second screening test that's often recommended is an electrocardiogram. And electrocardiograms were historically recommended as a screening test for tricyclic antidepressant ingestion. I think it's a reasonable test, it's quick and it's non-invasive, but certainly I don't think that we're um, going to reach the same yield that they did when, when tricyclics were much more prevalent, and I don't think it's abso an absolute routine screening test on all patients. The last test that we commonly do as a screening test on patients is a basic metabolic panel. And the metabolic panel was primarily targeted at looking at an anti for an anion gap acidosis, which suggests several significant ingestions. Um, it's a reasonable screening test. It gives you a lot of information, including some ideas about renal function. Uh, however, I think it's important to understand that if you are considering a cause of a metabolic acidosis, that frequently the first bloods that we obtain from a patient presenting to the emergency department may be fairly close to their ingestion, and that may not allow sufficient time for um, many of the poisons that are associated with metabolic acidosis to actually develop a metabolic acidosis. So if you're really worried about it, it's probably more useful to get a metabolic test further on in their course rather than right away when they present to the emergency department.
Other tests that are frequently considered for poison patients include a urine drug screen. It's important to realize that these generally urine drug screens don't affect our emergency department management. We're, ba we're treating patients based more on symptoms than on their drug screen. Uh, or a serum salicylate. Now, serum salicylate is a reasonable test, but unlike acetaminophen, those patients usually develop symptoms before they get severe toxicity. So in a patient where you can continue to evaluate them, a routine screening salicylate may not be as necessary as, a, as an acetaminophen. The last step in managing a poison patient or evaluation and management of a poison patient is really observation. And the general recommendation of observation is for six hours. Now six hours was derived again from patients who presented with tricyclic antidepressant overdose. And what we found is, uh, what was found is a large number of patients who died from tricyclic overdose all develop symptoms within six hours. And therefore, the six hour observation was put forward and that if the patient has no symptoms within six hours, they're very unlikely to go out and develop uh, severe toxicity from, from TCAs. That has been generalized across all overdoses. There have been some studies that have come out since that have suggested shorter observation periods may be appropriate. Um, the issue is that really um, most poison patients would do well without any treatment at all. So it's difficult to come up with a standard recommendation. The reason I think six hours is a reasonable amount of time is that when you look at drugs, they, they can cause unpredictable effects. The histories that we're getting are often inaccurate. We may not know about all the drugs that patients have taken. They may have uh, unusual or idiosyncratic reactions to particular drugs. And six hours is an amount of time that's going to allow most standard release drugs to reach their peak serum concentration. For the most part, toxicity is going to correlate well with peak serum concentration. So if you have a patient who's gone through the period of peak serum concentration, they haven't developed severe symptoms, they're very unlikely to develop later, with, with a few exceptions. Now, one big exception is a modified release preparation. It's important to realize that any type of modified release drug is not going to be uh, absorbed well within six hours, and there's a good chance their peak's not going to occur to well after that. So those folks usually need a longer period of observation. So that's really it. That's the way that I approach the evaluation of management of a poison patient. I'm going to go ahead and resuscitate the patient in the manner that we expected, early airway management. I'm going to treat the patient with uh, hyperventilation early on in case they have some degree of metabolic acidosis, treat their hypotension with fluids, epinephrine or norepinephrine, potentially in very high doses, narrow complex tachycardia, going to treat with sedation and fluids, wide complex tachycardia, treating with sodium bicarbonate boluses, bradycardia, atropine, and pacing. Once the patient's resuscitated, I'm, I'm going to, or if they present stable, I'm going to perform a risk assessment considering the drug, the dose, and the patient. Based on that risk assessment, I'm going to either decontaminate the patient or go straight uh, to observation. I'm going to perform some a screening acetaminophen test at a minimum, potentially some additional testing depending on uh, what I think they took or what other tests that are commonly recommended in my setting. And then I'm going to observe that patient for symptoms for a minimum of six hours. Thank you very much for your time.